How much does your homestead rely on outside resources? Do you have to bring in products to feed your soil, feed your livestock, to keep the garden going? If supply chains went down, what would you do? On today's episode, we're going to talk about closing the loop on systems around your homestead for greater self-sufficiency and sustainability. Looking around, I find the sea. I think I need a change. The rat race I want to flee, my world I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. It's a Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. My name is Harold Thornbro, joined again by Rachel Jamison. How are you doing today, Rachel? I'm doing good. Great. Uh, what was the what was the updates on the homestead this week? Doing anything special or just keeping on doing the same old thing? Oh, well, I think I told you last week I harvested carrots because of my bunnies have gotten in. Well, I ended up harvesting all of them this week. I seen that picture of that big pile of carrots on Instagram. That was amazing. I was like, wow, look at all. That. How, how many would you say you harvested? I don't know, but I, there, there was probably about 45 to 50 pounds total. Yeah. It was quite the pile. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a four <laughs> by eight bed. I just planted them real close together. So you're busy fermenting and canning or whatever you're doing with them. And yeah. And I yeah. decided to power wash them because I didn't want to scrub. I seen that. It worked pretty, really well. Did it? I mean, it took it, took it yeah. off pretty good. Yeah. I that's... had to shake it around a little bit to get the bottom ones, but yeah. it worked amazingly well. Hmm. Something to try. Yeah. yeah that's know. pretty neat. I would probably work with all root vegetables because man, they all get pretty nasty. Yeah. yeah do that with yeah, your probably. turnips and radishes and beets and everything. Beets. Yep. You got me thinking I'm going to have to break out the power washer next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, potatoes. I think I yeah. did it in a laundry basket. But if you got a basket, might take the skin off the potatoes, though, huh? It might. Yeah, yeah a little soft. I normally don't wash mine before I store them, anyways. Not yeah, potatoes. right. Yeah. But I think if you got like one of those old bread crates, the something with holes on the bottom, they would have washed better. Nice in a laundry basket. Yeah, I didn't see what I do this week. Oh, I worked on the greenhouse a little bit. I cleaned it up and I put in some uh, metal for back pans for where I'm putting my wood stove in. I ended up buying a wood stove. I did not build one. I was going to build one. I was talking last week about maybe building one out of a little propane tank, but I ended up buying a, they, they call them, uh, they're camp wood stoves. They're for like tents and things, but this one's, you know, a couple feet long. And so it's a small wood stove and I'm going to actually put that because, you know, the greenhouse is pretty small. So I put some metal in there and I put a piece of metal in the roof for the flue to go through. And uh, I'm going to, I mean, that wood stove is actually going to be here tomorrow. And then I'm going to get that installed and um, start uh, getting the greenhouse back together for the winter. So nice. looking forward to that. Uh, what else did I do? I can't wait to see uh, pictures of that. Just been using some, some things out of the pantry. You've been, uh, doing a lot of that or cooking out of the pantry? Yeah, I've been cooking. I made, I maybe I shouldn't have made, but I made carrot cake. Hey, <laughs> of course, because we got carrots. You got to do uh, it. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing that. And I made applesauce and starting to clear out the freezer. Hopefully that means we'll fill it with deer. Hopefully. So, yeah, I'm, yeah. I've been processing me- some bones from a, a hog and a beef that we got so we were actually at a menards uh last night because i had to pick up that metal for the greenhouse and uh i was uh looking at some uh deep freezers because i'm thinking we're so full i might actually have to buy another freezer and i know for a while they were uh, it was they were actually getting kind of hard to find everybody was grabbing right. them and they were like back ordered on them and stuff and uh, they had plenty of them there so i'm thinking well push comes to shove and i get a deer and i have to go get one i can go get another small freezer i guess right. yeah. yeah i didn't want to have to buy another one but if we have to we will um, yeah, I have a lot of fruit and vegetables in mine. I suppose I could do something with them if I had. Yeah, that, I kept thinking that too. I could pull out the corn. I got a lot of corn and cabbage, things like that in there. I could pull that out and and can right. it and uh, make the room because I did just kind of throw it in there because I didn't feel like canning it at the time. So 
um, yeah, that's what's been going on around here, though. I'm looking forward to really getting involved on in that greenhouse probably next week and getting that wood stove, getting some shelves built back in there, getting getting everything going with that. So, what are but, you most excited to plant in there? Oh, well, anything that'll grow. I mean, it's gonna be winter time, and it still isn't gonna be like super hot in there. I mean, I'm gonna stock up the wood stove at night, but it's still gonna have some pretty cool temperatures. So it's probably gonna be leafy greens and okay. you know maybe bok choy, things like that, and lettuce and you know things that'll grow. I <laughs> that, love bok choy. Yeah, I do too. It's good. I actually don't, I mean, it's so tender that, um, you know, I get an early spring, maybe late fall crop, but you can't do, I can't grow it outside in the summer no, at all around no, here. It's too hot. Yeah. Way too hot. It's just pretty tender crop today. We're going to talk about something I enjoy talking about. Um, I like thinking about, I always like to think about, especially with a small property for people like you and me, this is something that uh, you have to be thinking about closed loop systems because you're trying to uh, do as much as you can on a small property and you're trying to put in as little, as few inputs uh, as you need to. Uh, it, it's just, well, any homestead really. I mean, your goal is to bring in less, but produce as much as you can on property and that from beginning to end and, and close the loop. Uh, and what I mean by closed loop is, uh, well, it can deal with animals. It can be, uh, it, uh, with the garden, with compost and all those things, even together in, in the loop, um, working together. And so you know, we'll talk about soil amendments, the garden, food forest, livestock, you know, um, heating supplies, everything. Uh, you can actually close the loop on a lot of things on a small piece of property on any homestead. You can't close the loop on everything. You really can't. It's very, very difficult to be 100% self-sufficient. I don't yeah. know anybody that is, um, and and that's okay. But it is it is nice to be able to close that loop on some things and be able to completely be in control of that production on your property and not worry about if you can get supplies or get any kind of inputs to keep it going. So that's what I want to talk about today. I think that'd be kind of fun to think about maybe some of the things we're doing, some of the things you can do. Um, as far as a, a closed loop system. So do you have some closed loop systems on your property? Would you say are completely closed loop? Completely closed loop? Yeah, that you don't bring any inputs in. Boy, I don't know. And, you I know, the thing- some of my perennial vegetables are, okay. I mean, yeah. like asparagus, strawberries, uh, walking onion. Are you buying Garlic the- is starting to get there. Are you buying the compost to put on the soil to feed the soil to grow those? I am, and You're I'm working, working on, that, on. I have my make, first compost pile, and I've made it fairly large. Hopefully, my neighbors don't complain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, again, you you got to think about every input on something. Yeah. It's like, what does it take? Did I have to buy anything? Did I have to bring anything exactly. from an outside source? Now, you can expand the idea of a closed loop to local. Um, like right. you could say, okay, I, I'm getting wood chips at you know, a local place for free and bringing those in. And so, or, you know, so you can expand and say it's off property, but I'm still considering that part of Lowe's yes. closed loop. You could even say, you could even expand it into your neighborhood and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm trading something with a neighbor to get a supply for that, you know, and, and make that part of your, your loop as well. The loop can get bigger. Um, it, it's just where you want to stop it and how big you want to make it. Um, I mean, honestly, the the closer to your property or even on your property that you can have that loop, the better, the more stable it is, um, the more uh, the less chance there is for failure in that loop. Because if your mo neighbor moves or they stop supplying it wherever you're getting your supplies at for free or something, of course, that loop ends and you're having to find another place. We have been talking with one of our neighbors because they have an enclosed fence area where they put their leaves. Mm-hmm. They don't have a tractor and they've been having problems turning it because it's a pretty big place. And yeah. so I think we're going to be, it's too late this year, but next year, I think we're going to be combining all of our leaves and we're going to turn it with, they're going to give the storage space and we're going to turn it with our tractor. That's great. See, that's a perfect yeah. example of expanding that, that loop and getting yeah. that involved where it's you're creating compost and uh, soil amendments and, and whatnot for your property, but you're helping them out as well. And, and yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a perfect example of that. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the simplest ways a person can start working towards closing loops on their homestead is with soil amendments. 
I think compost is probably one of those things that a lot of people buy. A lot of gardeners are buying their compost, their soil, their wood chips, their manure. They're bringing all that stuff in. Me too. I've done a lot of it as well. Um, but you can do a lot of those soil amendments. You can create a lot of those on your property. It takes a little bit of extra work. takes a little bit of time to develop that system. But it's something most homesteaders can really do. Uh, just a, a simple compost pile for one thing. I mean, if you just start taking your scrap food and yeah. the, the the scraps from the garden uh, and putting them in a compost pile, you can start a compost pile and and create a soil amendment for your for your garden. Um, wood chips. If you have trees that you're coppicing and and plarting and and doing on your yeah. property, you can and you have a wood chipper. Again you have to buy a wood chipper and bring that yes. on property, but you know, but you could, I mean, cut them down small, lay them in a pile, compost and break them down that way. Even, I mean, it, it creates a, it creates a compost more yeah. than a wood chip, but you know, it, you can do that as well, even without a wood chipper. That was one of the reasons that we put, we planted popple and mulberry hybrid mulberry mm -hmm. along our, the garden to keep as, like a hedgerow, we're going to keep them short. But that was one of the reasons we did it was because we wanted to coppice them or pollard them, one of the two. Yeah. And then run them through the wood chips for the Ramio wood. Yep. For the garden. And plus I, all the. I mean, we're just a small, we're a small lot. So we have to look for multiple ways to put additions into our soil. Yeah. And like yeah. you mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the leaf mulch, it's a great additive to the garden. It's a great, it's something that'll do wonders for your garden, pile up those leaves on your garden and, and break them down into compost. It's even better, uh, create leaf mold with them. And that's yep. great for the garden. Um, but you can even get a little bit more complicated. You can take soil amending a little bit further. You can actually make your own blood and bone meal. You can take any animals, say you're butchering chickens or, or rabbits or, pigs or anything you're doing, you can actually dry that, grind it and make your own blood and bone meal for your garden. Well, and with chickens, you can do feather meal. There you can. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's one more yeah. thing you can even make. I, have you ever done your own bone meal? I, I have not, but it's something okay. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking a little bit about. For me, I mean, I don't know if I did it wrong. I'm sure somebody very technical would say I probably took out some of the minerals, but I when I make my bone broth, I'll make my bone broth and then I will, after that first batch, I will cook them again until they're mush. Yeah. And then that's what I use. I put them in the small compost. What was a small compost pile? Now we've made it much bigger, but I've, yeah, I've added entire carcasses to my uh, compost pile with bones and all in it. And it breaks down over time I and mean, it'll break down, right. you know, just butchering them and throwing them in there. Um, and, you know, so you're getting the benefit of that bone meal in there. Uh, it's not exactly the same as powdering and grinding it, right, you know, or right. you're drying it and grinding it and putting it on your garden. So it takes the application slower to your garden, which ain't bad necessarily, especially if you have a consistent flow of it. Um, but yeah, it's one of the things that uh, you can definitely do. And it's something that I think blood meal get pretty, uh, uh, yeah, it seems right. like a nasty thing to make. I mean, you're drying blood right, yeah. and powdering it up, but it, but it is a great, it is a great re right. uh, garden resource. It really is. But you can, I mean, you can powder those bones. Those bones just dissolved yep. to nothing. It's yeah. pretty, it's not too hard. Yeah. What, what was I just thinking? I was thinking about um, bone blood feather meal. Oh, I know. The best garden we ever had was when my husband fished a lot one year. Oh, and yeah. The fish carcasses in the mm -hmm. garden. That was an amazing garden the next year, but one of the better gardens. Yeah, these are definitely things any homesteader could do with what you have on hand. And even if you're not dealing with animals, I mean, you know, you still have the, the garden waste and food scraps and things like that. But manure... I think about manure. I mean, everybody knows rabbit manure is great for a garden. You can compost your chicken manure and put it in your garden. I mean, you know, you have to be careful. Again, this is so much better doing it yourself and closing the loop on manure even because <clears throat> when you're getting an outside resource, you don't know what they fed those animals. Right. And we talked about that before on a podcast, how they can be feeding them hay that will pass right through the system and stay in the manure that will kill your garden. And so yeah. you, if you can close the uh, close that loop on the manure that you're adding to your garden, that's a really good thing because you just, unless you just absolutely know everything about where you're getting it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned biochar in our notes. Uh, we've talked about that before, but that's something you can absolutely do on your property as a soil amendment to, to, to work in that loop. 
Yeah. You can do bones. You can do wood chips with it. You can do eggshells with it. I mean, you can make biochar out of a lot of really. Things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I shared, I shared it before in other show notes when we talked about it, but I shared that video series. Correctly. It's worth adding again. And yeah. Doing it small scale. Cause I mean, my other friend, Mark Baker does it, but he does it huge scale. So he, mm-hmm. um, Craig does it small scale, which is nice when you're a small urban homesteader like we are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned compost teas and things also to add yeah. to the, to the garden. That's something so easy to do. Uh, don't smell great, but it's easy to do. <laughs> no. I mean, and like comfrey, uh, comfrey, you can use other, you can do, just use weeds too. Yeah, and absolutely. Can, Pull the weeds and uh, dandelion and, and things like that yeah. will make great uh, compost teas. Tea. What's a teas? And like I said, they are an instant additive to your garden. They will just boost things. I mean, basically it's just a, it's, it's just an inoculation uh, of everything and, and it real, it'll do a lot for a garden. Absolutely. Yeah. I haven't uh, gotten real scientific. I have a few friends that get really scientific post yeah. teas and they aerate them and everything and they smell super bad, but work. <laughs> yeah. That's the same way with me. I'm kind of lazy about it. I just throw it in a bucket, right. throw some water on it and forget about it for a few days. And it's like, Ooh, can't forget about it no more. Cause you, right. you'll know it's there. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I'll do the same thing. And then you have to definitely mix that in with some water and thin it down a little bit. Cause it's pretty strong <laughs> and before you go adding right. it to your garden. So, but it's great stuff for sure. I especially like using that around trees i use that a lot around trees i'll mix yes, up a so bucket I, of it and just dump the whole bucket around a tree um that works really really well but i think it's a it's a great place to start at closing the loop uh get a compost pile going at the minimum it's just a great place right. to begin because as we know it's the beginning having good soil is the beginning of everything else it's the life of your homestead it's life gen- in general but it is the life of your homestead if you've got poor soil it's hard to mm, yeah. complete this loop anywhere else it really is well yeah and and eventually things start to get sick because yes there's no nutrition in that space. Yeah. You're growing the food for your animals. You can't grow the food without good soil to feed the animals. And the loop just doesn't yeah. complete. So you really need to start with the soil, getting that soil healthy. So it's just a yeah. great place to start in that loop. I mean, and the tools can be hard. I was going to say my husband got our, we got a leaf mulcher and a wood chipper, not an industrial one. It just does little ones, but for yeah. meal chips, it, it will work fine. Cause those are small branches. We got that off of either facebook marketplace or craigslist yep. i have a gas so. one that i bought off of marketplace and it's pretty good i, ha- I like it that it has the leaf mulcher in the top of it and stuff and it's just like a five horsepower i didn't pay a lot for it a couple hundred bucks before i had that i still have this i have an electric one and it's not bad actually but it won't do leaves but it'll actually chew as big of a stick up as my five horsepower gas one but oh. it won't do leaves of course it's just got a real small hole so it'll do a couple inch you know, two, two and a half inch uh, stick right through there, you know, and grind them up. Um, I like doing the, uh, I'll do that with the sunflower uh, stalks because they're, you know, yeah, I got those big mammoths stuff, and I'll feed them through that thing. And it, it makes a nice, uh, it, it, it it's a, makes a nice mulch, but it breaks down really quick when you do that with and sunflowers. Corn, corn stalks. Corn, yep. Um, I think we're going to do it with some of the sorghum. Yeah. 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 So yeah, those, they work good for that. It's good. It's a good piece of equipment to have for sure. And, uh, you know, you don't have to, um, get elaborate with a compost bin it can literally just be a pile or you can enclose it or you can buy compost bins uh it doesn't have to be an expensive thing but if you live in a neighborhood or something you might want to enclose it you might want to try to keep animals out of it if you're putting any right. kind of it depends on what you're putting in it too if you are right. throwing whole carcasses in there or something <laughs> yes. animals will de- you'll have possums and raccoons climbing through your compost bin like crazy you know um if you don't enclose that and block it off from them uh, so you do have to be, you know, there is some thought you have to put into that a little bit. I have some piles around here. I have uh, three compost bins, but I also have about three compost piles in different oh, wow. places. I have a lot of compost going around here, but I'm feeding a lot of, you know, I'm trying to really close that loop to where I don't bring in anything. Right. Uh, this last year, because I expanded the garden out here to the side, I had to bring in a lot of stuff because I built a whole new garden. So I didn't have near enough for that. Yeah. That's why I'm excited about this opportunity to work with a neighbor because they have a very large place to do it and we actually have a lot of compost if i had a place to put it i'd put all the lawn clippings but right now we just mulch everything and put it back Mm -hmm. on the lawn but yeah given the opportunity we could make a lot more than we do and that's fine that's just composting in place basically (laughs) i mean it breaks down right there in the spot but you know you can make a little bit more 
of a something that you can go to and get an actual bag of compost or wheelbarrow of compost anytime you want. And that's nice to be able to just add throughout the year to something if you want to feed something. Um, so yeah, I mean, get started with your soil amendments. I think it's a good way to begin the loop, begin to close that loop. And I think it's a real necessary part. Uh, if you do not start there, you will always be bringing in inputs. You will always have to buy some topsoil or buy some compost or buy some wood chips or buy some manure or something. You're going to have to bring in inputs to feed that garden if you do not have a compost pile going or have a way to start feeding that that soil. So it's just something you have to think about. It, at the very least, be like you said, raking your leaves onto your garden beds and putting your lawn clippings on it. I mean, that that is feeding in soil and it's part of that loop. And you can do that without even, you just have to have a lot and you have to really focus on getting it in the right place. Yeah. So it's something you can definitely yeah. do. Now that leads to the next thing, which is the garden and food forest, your trees, your orchards, whatever you want to call it, but growing things, growing things out of the soil. Uh, it's part of that loop. It's, it's something that's going to be in there if you're going to combine that loop with anything, I mean, having healthy soil isn't no good. If you don't have anything growing in the loop, you have to start growing some things. So soil amendments are part of that. You have to, you're baking your soil amendments to feed that garden, your food forest, your orchard, but that's just where it begins. We also think about seed starting. You, yes. You know, it's, uh, it's part of, uh, it, it's a learning process. If you've never grown anything from seed, you know, it, it, takes a little bit of practice to know how much to water something to get it going, how much heat it needs, how, you know, the whole system, if you're going to do it in trays and then transplant, or if you're going to do it direct, sow it in the garden, some things work better one way and some things work better the other way. And it's a learning process. So seed starting is, is a skill you will develop. Um, that's yeah. part of that loop. And I, I think skills are definitely a part of the loop, not just oh, things, yeah. but skills. Skills are <laughs> a huge part of the loop. And I mean, you don't have to, wake up tomorrow and start all of this tomorrow. Right. Just kind yeah. of go slow. I think my first several years I bought starts and then you usually work on starting your own seeds and you pick, yeah. you know, one or two things to try to perfect first and move on. Yeah. And and you can buy starts, but again, that's outside the loop and you're always going to be dependent on that if you don't learn how to, to start your own seeds, but to start your own seeds and to close the loop, you can buy seeds and you're still out of the loop, but to close that loop, you have to save seeds. Yeah. So, uh, we did a whole episode on that a while back and, uh, it's just an important skill to learn. And it's, it's really nice to know how to save the seeds of everything you're growing, but to do that, you really have to be growing heirloom vegetables. If you want something that's yes. true to type. So yes. if you really want to have a true closed loop system, you want to grow heirloom vegetables, or you actually added a couple of things to the notes, learn about cloning and grafting and things like yes. that. You can actually yeah. I do mean, there other are few vegetables, Yeah, obviously trees. You can, yeah. Tomatoes. Grab, you can but, do it with, yeah. uh, and I think peppers. Yep. I think so with peppers. I've never done peppers. I have done tomatoes. I've actually took cuttings off tomatoes. That. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, uh, you're saving your seeds and you're saving them from heirloom vegetables or you're cloning and grafting. You can reproduce the things that are on your property. So you want to yeah. get things you can do that with. If you're growing things, you can do that with you're closing, you're, you're playing a part in closing that loop. You don't have to bring in any resources to do that. Um, you don't have to source any materials or anything. You got it right there. When you do that, uh, it's nice to have some tools to do that. Uh, yeah. they're, they're just I a few things. Yeah. And I think this, for me, the tools are the easy part. It's um, acquiring the skills. I think. But knowing what tools yeah. are, are handy to have. I mean, you want to, I mean, a lot of them are just, when it comes to gardening, it's usually just basic hand tools. I mean, it's nothing complicated. It's just nice to have those things because it makes the job a lot easier. I mean, you could probably do it with a shovel and a pocket knife on most of this stuff if you wanted to, but you could get things that make the job easier for sure. Um, for sure. Make it easier to add soil amendments, make it easier to, um, to, uh, to actually harvest, make it easier to collect seeds, make it easier to clone and graft. There's a exactly. whole set of tools for grafting that you can get to make the job a lot easier. So, uh, with, you know, just uh, different knives and, and things you can get for that, for cloning so, or uh, for grafting. Yeah, so, some pretty wild things come out lately. Yeah, things that make it easier, honestly. I mean, you see right, things that, yeah. have you seen those little, I don't even, I've never used one of it. I think it's kind of neat for, uh, for trees. It's like a ball you wrap around the, 
the like you make pruners. a yeah you make a little cut or like, like on the yeah. and you wrap it around the, the limb or whatever and then cut below that and it roots in I the ball tempted to buy those until i yeah. saw someone make one out of a cup yeah you can make them like oh well yeah or you can just literally i mean you could wrap it in like a plastic or something and, and put it around so i mean you can yeah, do some different yeah. things like that and i, I thought i'd try that this spring i think yeah spring is the best time to do that let it just do it right on the tree yeah the other thing i saw was i don't even know what it's called it looked like pliers or a tool of some kind and you cut and it actually cuts that grafting knot yeah yeah so you can just tie, put it right onto the next yeah, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool yeah i've seen those uh, yeah i don't have a set of those either and i think that would be really neat yeah, if you were doing a lot of grafting and you were really trying to expand right. your your food forest and you just want to graft a lot of things i think tools like that could make the job so much easier so much quicker yeah, um and and give tree person give you a lot more success rate too. I mean, that's, I, there's some things that when it comes to, uh, the stars taking, taking cuttings and grafting and, and rooting things, some things are super easy. Some things I do not have good luck with. I have a horrible time. I've tried, I've tried a lot of things and I've had a hard time with some stuff. If any tools to do, um, some mulberry right now yeah mulberry isn't bad i i was doing right. trying to do my apple trees i actually had a hard time with those so i did something i need some practice at and, but i think there's tools you could actually get to make that job uh easier and, and continue to just work on your knowledge and skills a little bit of how it works too i think that's important um so it's all again it comes down to learning as, as a big part of closing that loop one of the things we've learned homesteading is when you're learning you are unfortunately Plants are going to die in the process. Yes. It's just part of learning and you can't let it discourage you. I yeah, don't even know and it doesn't discourage me much with gardening and, and, right. and trees and things. Where the losses start to really hit you is when it becomes to animals and your livestock. Yes. Um, yeah. If you're making mistakes there and you're killing animals, that's a hard lesson. And that's a lesson you want to try to avoid if you can, because that's costing the life of an animal. And, and, uh, you know, and if it's a mistake you made that causes that, that, that hits you pretty hard. Um, yeah. So, I mean, sometimes it just happens. Sometimes an animal gets sick and dies. You do everything you can, or it's just, it was going to happen. And there was nothing you can do, but if it happens because you, you neglected something or you didn't do something that you yeah. should have done. Cause it you didn't know. Bad. Yeah. That I, can be. I may or may not have had this happen with chickens. <laughs> yes. It can it happen with chickens. It can happen with rabbits. I mean, it, yeah. there's things that, you know, I had a lot of rabbits die, um, from a uh, coccidiosis one time. And it, a lot of that was because I didn't understand the situation and what causes that. And I put them in an environment that spread that. And I didn't, and because of my lack of knowledge and understanding of the situation, you know, animals died because of it. And, and, and I felt really bad. As a matter of fact, I quit raising rabbits for a while because of that, because it hit me so hard. I actually took like a year or a year or two away from raising rabbits. Cause I was like, okay, obviously I don't know what I'm doing, you know? And, right. uh, but I learned from that and I went back to raising them and then it worked out from there on out. So you just learn from your mistakes. You try, but again, it can be, it can be a painful lesson, yeah. right? But just like soil amendments connected to the garden, the garden, the garden connects to livestock, um, especially if you're trying to close that loop because you can grow the food that feeds your livestock. This is something that becomes harder the bigger the animal is <laughs> it does yes, i mean if you're doing sure. pigs and cows and and you know sheep and things like that it can you need more land obviously for some of those things to be able to do that uh, but i find it not that difficult when you're dealing with small livestock to try to close the loop on small small livestock when it comes to feeding them but uh, especially with rabbits uh, rabbits is, are pretty easy to close the loop on because you can just harvest uh, you can either run them through tr uh, tractors and, and let them feed themselves for the most part, or you can harvest, uh, go out and actually harvest things for them and, and forage for them and bring it to them and feed it to them. And I do a lot of that. And that's always worked out well for me. And I think I could probably do it 100%, though I don't, because I try to keep my my rabbits uh, on both feed and yeah, um, I've heard that that's forage. a good idea. Just well, in case in I have case. to leave for two or three days, yes. I don't want to have to have somebody else go forage for my rabbits. So I like to keep right. them on both, so they can just give them pure feed for a couple of days, and it doesn't shock their system, you know. Yeah. And uh, now, do you do that with your quail? I actually bring, I actually feed the quail. Uh, I actually buy feed for them, so I haven't closed the loop on okay. quail. Uh, but you could, and I've actually looked into some things I could probably try to, they're a high protein animal. They need a lot, a high protein feed. Um, okay. 
but there's things you can do to close that loop uh, with chickens and quail as well. Um, you can grow things that they'll eat and you can give enough of it to them to close that loop. I mean, the reality is all animals were created to live in the wild and feed themselves. And so yeah. they can live on natural things. I mean, they don't have to have, you know, store bought feed. They can find things in the wild to eat if you've got enough of it. So you just have to do the homework, figure out what they can eat and feed it to them. And, and, it's not really more difficult than that. It's just figuring it out and getting a good crop yeah. of it and, and putting enough of it up for winter time when they can't get it. And that's, that's another difficult. That's the ticket where we yeah. live. That's if, what I've been trying to find information on tree hay for all of this. It's a little bit harder to find because <clears throat> it's not something that's new, but it's something that we're bringing back again. Because Yes. And I was going to times. mention that because there are some, I, I actually uh, ran across some great YouTube videos on that. Now, generally they're talking about feeding goats and sheep with tree yes. hay. Cause a lot of that comes from the UK and over there, yeah. it was a more popular thing to do the tree hay, put it up in barns and, you know, cut it and yeah. you cut it in the peak of summer when it's at their peak nutrients, put it up in barns, let it dry in a barn or whatever, and then feed it to them through the, uh, through the uh, winter. And, um, it, it works really, really well. I mean, it isn't as nutrient packed as what they would get from maybe some other sources, but it will keep them going, you know, through a winter. And it was a pretty common practice, especially in the UK uh, many years ago. Yeah, um, and like you said, they've, it's it's kind of faded in recent years um, with commercial hay, yeah, the way we bale it and sell it. And, yeah. yeah. And I think, um, I think it would be something that would be adequate for rabbits from what I understand. It is. It's very, like I said, you won't find too much information out there on rabbits. You usually find it more for goats and sheep, but it applies to rabbits. I mean, it's the same thing. If you find out the trees that rabbits flourish on like poplar, like mulberry, I mean, there's, there's certain ones that they do really, really well on. Um, then yeah, feed them that and they will, they will flourish on it and uh, do yeah, really, really well. Those are so easy to grow. I mean, I think I'm at the edge of being able to grow mulberry here mm -hmm. with my zone. But for the most part, a lot of people don't live in zone five or four. Yeah. Um, but you can grow them here. And yeah. Yeah. And something I've been doing here just recently, I have a lot of comfrey on this property. I mean, a lot of comfrey. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's something I've just spread everywhere. I just put it everywhere I can because I love having it like near every garden bed so I can do chop and drop. And I just like having it everywhere so I can use it, utilize it. Um, but this time of the year or right before this, in the last few weeks, what I have started doing is cutting it and sticking it in my garage. I have a place in there where okay. I put it up in the garage and it just dries in there and I can feed that to the rabbits and the quail in the winter time. And they like it. The rabbits more so than the quail, but the quail will peck at it and eat it. Do you have to be careful how much? There are people out there that say you do. I've never had a problem with feeding them all they want to eat. Now if, in the winter time, I obviously give them feed also. I think if you were only giving them that and that's the only option they had, they could possibly yeah. eat too much. But I'm giving it to them as part of a, you know, of a, of a whole of bunch day. of stuff. And in the wintertime, I'm giving them that and feed. Uh, so, you know, they don't and they eat as much of it as they want, you know. So um, yeah. I don't think it does any harm. I've never had a problem when I when I process the rabbits. A lot of times they say you can see stuff in the liver if it's developed, if they've gotten too much because yeah. it'll cause some problems. Or, I've never seen anything that looks bad. It all looks perfect to me. So um, yeah. I've never had an issue uh, with, we used with feeding to give them it to too our much. Chickens. Yep. But I never dried it for the winter. We would just give it to them in yeah. the summer. So you could probably do that with grass and such too. Yes, absolutely. You can actually make grass hay bales and stuff. Uh, you know, if you're collecting I've seen it in a bag. Nice little gadgets yep. that people have made to make, make little tiny make the bales. little bales. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there's something you can do with that. I mean, or you can grow your own. You can grow silage. You can grow things, you know, like corn silage. Uh, you make your own silage there that way with yep. your corn stalks and things. They'll eat that, especially your larger livestock, your goats, your sheep, your cows, yep. pigs will eat that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And I put a video in the show notes from uh, Nicholas Ferguson's page of people making silage, silage out of corn and putting it in 55 gallon drums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for a great. Smaller scale. We'll definitely make sure that's in the show notes for sure. Did you add the duckweed or did I? Did I see duckweed was put in there? Okay. Yeah. That is definitely a viable, that's definitely a viable. Yeah, it's uh, pretty high in protein. Yep. It's a very rich yes. um, thing you could do. Um, and you could uh, grow that in some kiddie pools or something if you had to yeah. <laughs> or collect yeah, it from Dakota, a pond. 
Dakota Cohen feeds it to his pigs. Yeah. Does he grow it intentionally or is he just go and harvest it? He has a pond that just grows it. So he goes and collects it and puts Mm -hmm. it in with, you know, milk and yeah. Grain, you know how pigs eat. Stop. Yeah, yeah. I've literally <laughs> yeah. seen people go buy a bunch of those cheap little kitty pools and set them all around their property and fill those up and grow duckweed in them and harvest it. it from those. Yeah, I've seen that too, and then feed that I to the rabbits I, and chickens. Yeah, it grows on our mm-hmm. ponds at our property. Yeah. So I should try bringing some of it back here and putting it in the garden. But I've actually even heard people eating it. Yeah, I've never. As I've never even looked into that, but I know it's great for livestock. <laughs> right. Yeah. I would prefer yeah. to feed it to my livestock, but I'm and, just saying it's, yeah. it does have higher protein content. And if you've got enough property, you can absolutely plant crops to grow for the seeds to feed your, your animals like corn and, and, yep. and things. You can actually grow grains for your animals to feed them. Um, without buying any you know uh i just had i uh, just interviewed uh jordy uh, buck up in uh, michigan uh, it'll be it'll release before this episode so it'll come out uh before this so you'll hear that but he's growing corn and and uh yeah. sun chokes drew some artichokes for his uh, pigs and feeding them uh, through the winter on that uh great idea you know and and sunflower uh he's growing sunflower yeah. seeds for feeding so his animals his rabbits and chickens home. yeah I chatted with him. On, I did not know you did this episode with him. <laughs> yeah. And I chatted with him this morning on Facebook. And he said he's growing Wade's corn and mammoth sunflowers. Mm-hmm. And then the art, Jerusalem artichoke for yep. the pigs. Yeah, so. feeding, feeding that to his livestock. So he's closing that loop. He's trying to grow even That's grains. And, cool. and what's funny is, you'll hear this in the podcast that we did. He's only got an acre of property. And he's doing that. It's amazing. He's growing a lot on this little acre of property. So he's closing the loop with a fairly small piece of ground, which is, which is pretty amazing. And we talked a little bit about what it would actually take to completely close that loop, you know, and everything. So you'll get some information there, but yeah, it's pretty good stuff. And and you get to, you know, so there's ways you can even do that, even grow uh, the grains and things. If you want to, if you want to grain raise your animals, you know, some of your animals and stuff. So you can do that. Like when you grow grains for animals, it's a little bit easier process because you don't have to thrash them and right. grind them. You can just toss a whole seed head in. Yeah, literally. Like if you're growing like mammoth seed, sunflower seeds, uh, sunflowers, you could take that entire head. And you could literally just toss that in a chicken pen, let them tear it up or whatever, and they'll have at it. And it's really good for them. Really, it's really high in nutrition and it's something they'll and get a lot from. Busy. Yeah, keep some busy. There you go. <laughs> but those are easy to those are easy to store. I mean, you could literally just like you said, put those in a barrel. I mean, you could just stack those. Those things oh, are yeah. about as big around as a barrel They're opening. Huge. You could just drop those things down in a barrel and layer them up. You know, just want to. I'd post some uh, moisture packs or something in there to keep them dry. You know, right? Because uh, I want to chipmunk proof them. Yeah, I'll throw some moisture absorber yeah. or absorbers in there and throw a lid on it and just keep the moisture out because you know we wouldn't want them to start mildewing or molding or anything like that and you could put up a i mean it a field of those would would provide a lot of feed for some animals and they're fun to grow and they're so easy to grow i mean they're just amazing and then you can collect a few of those seeds close the loop by planting those again and uh, save a couple heads just to replant your field of sunflowers you know when we had chickens we got soy free feed and the replacement for the soy was sunflowers. So, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's got a pretty good uh, yeah. food content for chickens anyway. Absolutely. It's just it's definitely something that would be super easy to help close that loop on especially small livestock. It would, it would be part yeah. of that. Part of that. Again, all this might take a little, if you're wanting to, if you're wanting to raise a lot of livestock, it takes a right, lot of space to grow enough food. Horse. Yeah, it, it <laughs> takes a lot of area right. to grow enough feed to cover them for the winter. It does, depending on where you live, of course, uh, in a place where, like right. where we live, it would take a lot of space to grow enough feed for your animals if you're growing too much or too large of animals. Sure. But definitely with small livestock, this is absolutely doable. Chickens, quail, rabbits, you can do this easy. Even uh, as you'll hear on the podcast, uh, Jordy is raising uh, pot belly pigs for me, you know, and again, right. it's a small pig. So it's like, it would, it's a lot easier to keep them supplied with food than it is even full-size pigs. So, um, yeah. Cause some of these pigs get really big. Yeah. They can eat a lot pigs, of feed. They're like four or 500 pound. Pigs. Yeah. But you take like the Cooney Coonies or the pot bellies or something Small like that. Ones. And yeah, they're, they'd be perfect for a, a you know, an acre or two uh, homestead and, and you could right. grow enough feed, feed for them if you was really intentional about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but that isn't all you have to think about when you're closing the loop is just feed when it comes to animals. There are there are other things to consider. Uh, we'll skip down to the breeding. I mean, if 
you know, some animals will just naturally kind of carry out that process, but you need to have the right stock for that. Of course, if you're raising, you know, rabbits, you're going to have to have a buck. If you're raising quail, you got to have some roosters, chickens, a rooster. I mean, you're going to have to have the right proper animals for that. Um, Some animals need a little help. Uh, Like my quail will not, will not nest. They will not build. I, I have to have an incubator and I have to brood them and I have to do the whole nine yards uh, to keep that circulating and, and for that to get, keep going. Um, so if you want to close the loop on quail, you got to You got to do that. It's a little more intensive. So you have to have some equipment. You have to have some knowledge of what you're doing there. Um, not hard at all. Matter of fact, I love doing it. It's super fun. It's, it's really easy too, especially with quail. I find it super easy. Um, but it is something you need to know. You just need to know the numbers and need to know, have the right equipment and, and, and do it. And it's not hard, but like I said, some things need a little assistance. Some things they just do it like rabbits. Right. It's going to happen right. whether yeah. you want it to happen. <laughs> They'll find a way even when you try well, to you keep them. You just have from... to put the mail in there. <laughs> Sometimes they just find a way over there. They'll get oh, there. They they'll really? they'll okay. get out of a cage or something and they'll make their way over there. And they'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a way they'll find it so uh and you'll have baby bunnies you know so it, it, it's great i mean it's like you, i mean you can be real intentional about it and breed them and try to keep it's why i like doing cages to some extent more than you know colony raising or anything like that because you can right. control it and you can you can't overbreed a doe too much and you can take care of your animals a little bit better and and just have some proper husbandry there and really kind of care for them proper but there's just some things you can do to help that along to you know, and, and just knowing when to put things together, you know, you don't want them always producing because you don't want them breeding right before winter and having to deal with that. You might want, you know, especially with larger yeah. livestock and have to or deal with that in the heat. winter. I know with rabbits, they do worse yep, the, the worst of heat. Yeah. Heat. So then there's just, there's times to make that a better option than others. So, you, you know, it's just things you learn as you go. So yeah, knowledge and equipment. And if, <laughs> and if your animals are healthy and you're eating your animals, then you'll be healthier. Yeah. But there is something to consider about the health of the animals too. Um, taking care of your animals. Uh, there is a time when your animals very well may get sick. Do you, and do you have the things, can you close the loop on that? That's a little more difficult because when you start thinking about outside medications and things, if you could not get those, do you have enough knowledge about things they can take or ways you can care for them to get them healthy? without needing that outside right. resource it's nice to have advantage of that to be able to take advantage of that if you, if you need to but what if you can't what if the supply chain goes down and you're not able to get something is there a way you can take care of your animals it's good to, to try to learn that before it ever comes yes. about and i would take yes. advantage of the outside resource anytime i needed it while yeah. it was there but i would also gain the knowledge to know how to do it if it wasn't there yeah and the smaller your homestead, I think the more important it is to maintain the health of your livestock mm-hmm. and your animals. Because, for example, Greg Judy with his sheep, if he has a sick sheep, it's not a big deal because it's one out of what, a thousand? Mm-hmm. If you get a sick rabbit, that's part of your closed loop system and you're yeah. only and you only have four, it's a much bigger deal. Or it's my one buck. <laughs> you better have a right. backup buck. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's why I think it that knowledge probably is a little bit more important when you have a small homestead. Yeah. You can't just call an animal because it's sick. That's part right. of your program. Right. Um, I think about just natural things like, you know, if I get a, a rabbit that gets ear mites or, you know, I might, you can buy medicine for that mm-hmm. or you right. can use vegetable oil and olive oil and things like that to try to get rid of them. I mean, just knowing that, that you can use yeah. things that maybe don't work quite as well but we'll do the trick if you know what you're doing and how to do it um just just having that knowledge usually with herbal medicine or more natural remedies you have to apply the process more often than if you went like the pharmaceutical or the synthetic route absolutely uh, i know one of the things and i'm going to tell everybody to research this but i did a lot of research and grew it just as an experiment to see if I could was tobacco. One of the reasons I grew tobacco is it's a fantastic wormer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah. And I know that Mark Baker feeds his pigs. Now they, they can choose it like a mineral. So he doesn't make them eat it, but they'll eat biochar. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I know people put 
apple cider vinegar. I was getting ready to water. say that. I've and even my rabbit and grow my apples. You can yep. make your own apple cider yep. vinegar. I, it's something and I've done since the beginning. A, yeah, yeah, that becomes a closed loop system, and you can put that in your pets or your pets, your livestock's <laughs> water, and then you can do the same thing with garlic. Yep. A lot of people put garlic in their animal Absolutely. waters. Um, Knowing like what to feed them it, to keep them yeah. healthy is a huge part of, of that, of that knowledge in part of that closed loop system. Absolutely. And I think yeah. I haven't had a lot of problems with sick animals. I don't have cows and pigs and things like that, which are more pigs are definitely more prone to it. I think they're, they're pretty common to get things, you know, they get sick and they have, they have to be treated, you know, on rabbits. Yeah, they get things. I mean, there's definitely things they get, but for the most part, I, I haven't had a lot of problem with my rabbits getting sick quail. I've, never seen a sick quail <laughs> since i've been raising quail um i know chickens you know they're prone to some things too yeah some lung things <clears throat> and I, yep. and that's too though it's just the animal husbandry if yeah. you keep their bedding clean mm -hmm. they're not stuffed in a i we actually had some chicken sickness because we had such a small house for them because we could only have four where we're at and um and we realized it was because we needed to be keeping the hut that we had them in at night a little bit cleaner and free of more free of the dust and stuff so yeah just the animal husbandry can help yeah, they're really the prone to the respiratory too. things for sure yeah, yeah yeah something you gotta take care of and they they stir up so much dust anything that's there they're gonna kick yes. it up and make something so they're gonna be breathing it in so you want to keep for that sure. as good as you can um jeff lawton i think do you did you ever watch that he made I can't, I'm going to have to try to find the video, but he made a video on putting a chicken run in a suburban lawn or in a suburban household. And he actually put like wormwood. He planted herbs within oh. that chicken area Yeah. for the, for the chickens to stay healthy, like wormwood mm -hmm. and probably some comfrey. Yeah. Just all of those things. So there are herbs and stuff too. That you can yeah. That will help them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, plant planting, like I said, it's part of that closed loop, having the garden that can feed them, having the trees that can feed them, you know, the seed grains that grow that, that you can feed. I mean, having, putting these things in the process um, is part of that loop, but that loop expands even beyond animals. Like I said, if you're growing trees for pollarding and, and, and coppicing, we, if you're burning wood, you know, you could, it's actually be a heat source for you too. And it can be a renewable re, re, resource that just keeps coming back, keep cutting the wood. And it's part of that loop. You can make a loop there as well. And, and having knowledge for that heat source, knowing what, what to plant, like say you want to uh, grow black locusts because it's a, it's a really hard wood. Not only does it make a great firewood, it makes a great, it makes great uh, things for building things, um, yeah. handles for, uh, uh, um, fence posts, just all kinds of things. So you can, Trellises. It, yeah, I mean, you having these good woods, uh, having all these trees and having things that you can do that with, not all trees can be coppiced. Uh, some right. will die if you cut them back like that, you know, knowing what yeah. trees you can do that with and what trees you, you can't is really great. And, and rate and having those trees on your property, um, to supply for the, the livestock and to supply for your soil amendments, to supply feed for your livestock, to supply product that you can make things right. out of that you can well, use on I your mean, homestead the sugar maple that yeah. supplies you with sugar yeah absolutely you know, absolutely one more loop and i mean that's a really big tree that takes a long time to get to the point where you can tap it but yeah, yeah. that's an example of trees well, that can i mean yeah if you what you write on tip you can have oak to make handles out of and and things right. and, and 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 weave baskets i mean that's what they use to make the thin strips to weave like really heavy duty baskets the oak baskets okay. and stuff you can get into that i mean if it's something that it tickled your fancy and you wanted to try something like that i always thought those willow have you seen what what are they called is it waddle fencing yeah i think that's willow mostly yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought those are cool yeah, those are cool. And uh, we mentioned on a couple episodes ago about those, um, like the uh, Victorian farm episodes. And on one of those yeah. episodes, they have a guy come in and make the oak baskets. Yes. I remember he's like standing on it. It was like holding up and everything. And it's a neat skill. And I mean, it wouldn't be an easy one to learn, but how fascinating is that? I just love that. That was really cool. I love yeah, that episode. Yeah. Yeah. But it goes even further. I mean, you can even grow stuff in your garden. I mean, you think about, we talked about on an episode not too long ago about growing cotton and you could make things out of cotton if you wanted to get into that, or you could grow loofah to make your own loofah uh, products. Have That's you, really have neat. You, have you what? grown loofah? 
we yeah this year but i haven't yeah, really used fun. anything yet it's still dry and i never even opened them up yet oh really okay. <laughs> there's the yeah, slide they're dry they're fun. yeah the, uh, the, then you know you can use animal sheep wool and yeah those lots of stuff there but even on the plant side i mean just the medicinal herbs you can make your own medicines right. make your own uh, weaving materials make your own dyes if you're doing like making your own uh, wool and yarn uh, cotton yarns you can make your own dyes for that i mean so many plants provide those things right from the garden again closing that loop you know uh right. that you can use all that stuff and make your stuff for your actual house and and yeah wool hides bones people make things out of bones that are pretty cool there's all kinds of tools it that people make cool. out of bones and things i ran across some so websites I, on that i have something cool that i'm pretty sure you're not aware of since you probably don't wear makeup <laughs> not often no <laughs> no my daughter uses charcoal eyeliner that really she bought. she bought it online it's made traditionally i cannot remember all of the details but it's it's really cool the person actually uh burns up almonds yeah the almond mm -hmm. uh, shells and makes charcoal out of it and apparently that's a very traditional thing that that's pretty neat <laughs> i actually seen somebody had a part of their course was on that maybe it was melissa k norris or somebody had a where they made like using natural products for makeup making their own makeup and then yeah. like so far, i make chapstick we make chapstick you, you know just to keep your you know your lips from breaking up in the winter cold winters around here but right. yeah i make that uh and we make a comfrey salve that works great on dry hands oh that makes that's right. wonders on dry well, hands that's the other thing i mean that's closing the loop I mean, yep. you, you use the fat from your animals yep. and then your comfrey and you make mm -hmm. salve or you can I use, mean, or you can, if you have bees, bees, you can use the bee wax for that to make those products as well. Yeah, a lot of that stuff's made from bee wax. And all of these can be products that you either close the loop with, or you, if you end up with extra, like mm -hmm. you do, you sell yours on, you sell your comfrey on Etsy mm -hmm. you yeah. yourself. Um, you can use these to make products for off, farm, Absolutely. off homestead income, which can provide the money to help close the loop. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. I mean, in it expands and the I, loop but it's part of it it can right. be part of it absolutely and i think the more you close that loop um yes you'll be busier but for me it's been a way for me to not work as much i still have a job and a small business mm -hmm. but because we save so much money on food and some other products yeah I, don't have to work as much. It's worked for me too. I mean, I went from working six yeah. days a week to three days a week because I've closed the loop some and we've saved a lot yeah. of money and I've been able to not work as many days a week now. I'm only working three days a week yeah. on an outside job and I get to spend the rest of that time yeah. doing this kind of stuff and working on my homestead, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which I, mean, I love. And this, it's still work, but I yeah. enjoy it more. <laughs> so, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, could, you could take this as far as you want. I mean, if you had a big enough property and you, I mean, you could, you know, I'm thinking about like, uh, I'm thinking of some homesteaders I know right now that they have like a pretty large woods and they're, they actually have, are cutting their own lumber and making their own lumber right. to build buildings and things. And, you know, and uh, so again, they're closing that loop because they have a sawmill. Yeah. They bought the My equipment, they get the knowledge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're doing it. So that's cool. My stepfather has a sawmill Yeah, and he cuts his own lumber and uses it to make stuff, but he also does it for other people. <laughs> And you could think, well, that's really expensive, and it can be. You can buy some really right. big equipment, but I, they actually make cheap sawmills that you just hook a chainsaw into and yeah. guide down through there too. I've seen those. But then you got maintenance, and again, part of part of a, this the closing that loop is is understanding even mechanical things. Say you have to fix your chainsaw yeah. or you have to fix your equipment. You know, learning about how those things work and gaining some knowledge there um, to be able to fix it's things sharpening. Yeah. Sharpening your chainsaw is, is definitely not the same as how you sharpen a knife. Yeah. And learning how to make handles for things. Because if there's one thing that breaks on a tool, it's the handle, the wooden handles on your shovels, your yes. axes, your thing. If you can coppice the wood from your property and shape a handle for something and install it, that is awesome. And I mean, it's how it was yeah. done for hundreds of years, but then we've gotten away from that. Now we run down to the local hardware store and buy a handle and pop it in. But really or, or just throw away the whole like thing. <laughs> I one. really want to try making, I think it sounds like a fun project for some reason is making like some wooden spoons. Yes. But, um, yeah. And Utensils. we have in the homestead front porch that does that. Oh, it makes some beautiful ones, doesn't it? Yeah. He's yeah, all time. I got remember, stuff. Yeah. I can't, I can't either, but he, he's but all time he posting. Does. Yeah. Posting them. Yeah. And they're beautiful. Um, 
but you can make bowls. You can make your, you can make all your things, your bowls, your spoons, yeah. uh, all kinds of things. Yeah. And you can make well, some neat here's stuff. One, if you have a large enough property and maybe it would, I'm not sure if it would work with goat's milk, but um, one of the reasons I got figs was I wanted to make cheese and the fig, if you cut off part of the fig, uh, the fig branch actually has rennet in it. Really? For making cheese. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and traditionally you, you would get that yeah. from the stomach of a, <laughs> of of a cow. cow. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So again, closing the loop. And then you can take products that you're making and then you can throw them out that mm-hmm. it because it's made out of natural products, it can go back in the compost if you didn't use it. Exactly. Your food scraps, things you collected from your garden, you know it's all good stuff. Now you're now you're taking the excess cuttings, say you're eating vegetables you're cutting some of that waste away from those vegetables you can throw that make your own stocks use that yeah. to make things yeah. um your meat as well make your own stocks there to 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 make soups and and stews and things but if if you can just pick one or two things and start trying to close that loop on those and then go to the next thing go to the next thing but you really it's amazing the society that we live in the mindset we're in how much input it takes because right. I know just about everything I try new on a homestead, I have to go buy a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And, well, and I'm always and it like, creates so much yeah. waste. And when we start to it does. that waste stream, as far as for me, that's part of the reason why we started eating nose to tail. Yeah. It was just that waste stream. Mm-hmm. And even if we don't eat it, how can we use it? And exactly. Maybe the dog will eat it. Maybe the cats will eat it. Maybe you can compost it, yep. but just not throwing we yeah. throw so much away now. And just even in paper just, and, and yeah. things that we could use, I mean, you can turn that into compost as well. I mean, there's things there. So, um, but yeah. yeah, the less you have to bring in and the more self-sufficient you can be in any one area, do that, you know, mm-hmm. and it takes some time. It, I mean, again, say I buy the equipment to incubate my quail and that breaks and I can't get another one. There are ways right. to do it. You can actually, I mean, they did it before there was ever electricity. You know, that, I mean, it's, it, you're setting them next to a wood stove and you're trying to regulate temperatures and, you know, it, it's complicated, but it's not right. impossible. You know, you what can definitely do, do it. it for you. Yes. A chicken can do it for you. I mean, if you're raising the right animals, I'm just thinking about, you, could you put your quail eggs under your chickens? You I could, think. you could, if you had chickens, you could absolutely do that. Get a broody hen. Well, they would, they would actually hatch a lot faster though. Would be, you'd have to maybe try to time it. And put them in to where they all hatch about the same time um, would probably be a good idea. But yeah, I mean, there's things you can do. Uh, and again, that's probably a lot of knowledge base. Uh, find out how they used to do it right. in case your equipment did go down. How was it done a hundred years ago? You know, uh, 200 years ago, how was it done? And that will give you a lot of insight on how you could close the, lo- uh, the loop, even if things went down. Now I can tell you one thing right now, if I was doing lumber, I wouldn't want to be out there with a two man saw trying to cut a, a tree long ways to create my own lumber, uh, stuff like that. I mean, I know how they did it and I would be like, no, <laughs> I'm not doing right. that. Oh yeah. You know, some of this uh, stuff is so, yeah, it takes so much more energy to do it, oh, but it's yeah, it just, still, I think, I mean, we do have to think about this cause you just, you just don't know. Yeah. There's some things I think are worth doing it that way. Some things are not some things I'm like, if, yeah. if I can't do it in a modern way, then that loop's going to go out the window and we'll find a different way to, yeah. to, to figure something out. Cause for some me, things are just crazy. For me, I think one of the things that it's worth doing, no till is worth doing. Yes. I think little, so. It's, it's not, it's easier to probably push that. Tiller. And I do think that that for me is things that are no till. I, well, again, I think there's a time. I think if you have, you're yeah. doing five acres of garden, you don't want to be right. no tilling. You know, I mean, I'd tell that if I'm growing food for hogs and I'm raising hogs, I'm trying to grow a couple acres of corn to raise those. Right. Guess what? I'm not going to no till that. I mean, that's going to get tilled and, and grow the corn that way. Yeah. Um, it, there's a place for everything, you know? And so, you know, what do you do if your tiller breaks? Well, you know how to fix it, have some parts on hand. I mean, I'm not going to go buy a horse and a, and a plow, you know, to get out there and do it that way, probably. So, you know what I'm saying? I mean, how extreme do you want to get on closing? Well, the I think that sounds fantastic. It'd be fun, but, <laughs> but it'd look a little weird on my little quarter acre property. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but even if you had even a, a five acre or something, that's just too much for that. You know, right, it's too it much. Is, it is. Uh, it's too much to have on hand. Uh, again, 
closed loop systems, if you can do them, are great. I don't think it's it, in this day and age. It's very. I I don't know that anybody's doing it one hundred percent. I just don't, I don't think you're doing it. You know, even when you think of Dick Prenicky, the guy that went to Alaska, he still had stuff coming in on airplanes. Yeah, exactly. He was all the way alone in the wilderness, yeah. which is what the video is yeah. about. So I, I think it's been a really long time since we've had that. And I don't know if we ever have. I think we've always depended on each other. As yeah. Society. There's always, you've always had a neighbor you could trade something with or a yeah. local store you could barter with to get, you know, trade the furs to get some supplies to, you know, there's just ways. Right. I mean, you were always getting something outside the loop a little bit, uh, and but it becomes part of your loop. It just, yeah. you, you just have to put some faith in that loop and a loop that big, when you expand that loop, you're putting some faith that that loop's going to be there tomorrow when you need it, you know? And and most of the time it is, it always has been, but who knows if there, I think the, the more things you can close that loop in on, it just makes you that more self-reliant and more secure. Yeah. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. No, there's not. And I think it also, like we talked about, makes things a little bit more affordable, especially with times mm-hmm. like right now when everything's going up the more you can do yourself yeah, and the more you can use everything, yep. the less money you're going to be putting out. And just the environmental impact too, of yeah. creating, you know, sure. all the, you know, nature It's one of the things that permaculture says all the time is, you know, nature doesn't have any waste. The leaves are falling right. to the ground. They're feeding the soil, they're feeding the tree. I mean, animals are dropping, everything's feeding each other. Everything's working together and there's a synergy and, there's no waste. And if the closer, I think you can get your homestead to being like that, the more stable right. it is, you know, and, you and more, and the better it is for the environment. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to trust the sources where you're getting things. I mean, currently mm-hmm. I'm getting my compost from a local compost company that mm-hmm. makes it and I trust them, but you know, let this summer, there's been a lot of talk about um, some compost issues. So yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, you just you have to trust where you're getting when you source even locally. You have to trust mm-hmm. where you're getting that. Yeah, so, your manure, your compost, your hay yeah. to feed your animals. You have to think it's all all that stuff is it's coming from sources you don't know anything about. You got a good chance of getting something you don't want on your property. Right. That's yeah. why that that closed loop is nice. But um, yep. yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the resources we've listed here. I you put you mentioned a book. A couple books or a book. I did mention a couple of books. I okay. don't know. Uh, I actually mentioned several because we we talked a little bit about herbs and stuff too. Okay, so coppicing agroforestry. Favorite. That's yes. That book is that book just came out this year. How do you pronounce his and last name? Mark. Uh, you don't know. I'm not going to try to slaughter it. <laughs> yeah, it's in the show notes, folks. So you yeah, can look it up. They're, they're going to be he. I'm on the waiting list for a class that they're going to be doing. Okay, and um. I've set the money aside for the last six months. So I'm hoping to be able to actually attend a class, not in person. They're going to do it online, but um, yeah, have, he's kind of the coppicing and pollarding guy. Have you done much of that on your properties? No, we've done. No, we haven't actually done. I've it. done We're quite a bit of it here. It. I, about the last three years, especially I've done a lot. Like uh, I got some mulberry and, and, and the things that I've been really working hard on. Yeah. I, I cut yeah. my mulberries. I got three mulberries. I cut them almost to the ground every oh, year. Yeah. And now, We've I mean, that. I cut this one, it was maybe two foot tall. I mean, I cut it to a stump and it's probably 25 feet tall in one right. summer. It grew that much. It blew. I would say we my pollard, mind. we pollard our. Yeah. And I do that uh, too. Mulberries because they will yeah. get huge. Yes. Yeah. Which is too big for our small property. Like if we were out at our 20 acres, not a big deal. So this year I cut them in half. They grew yeah. twice as tall. Yeah. So we're going to keep cutting those. Yep. And um, they do get bushier. We feel if you yeah. keep cutting them like that, they get a little bit more bushy, but they definitely do. Yeah. Which I did it on purpose in the beginning. Cause I was trying to get to produce more leaf for my rabbits. Cause it was basically a tree right. for that. I was using it for that. Um, but now, now that the limbs get so long and it's just so bushy now, I mean, I've, you know, I've started thinking about firewood from that when I coppice it and pollard it and things. I'm thinking about building things out of it. Um, this is funny right here behind me that I don't, I don't even hold on a second. <laughs> I don't even smoke a pipe, but I love carving oh, okay. and I carved okay. this pipe. I, <laughs> I carved this really cool pipe out of, uh, out of mulberry off my mulberry tree. Really? I actually so took a limb and cut this and, and I carved this po- really cool pipe. 
and it came out really you nice. What, I think it's cool. <laughs> what the hardiness and the BTU is of mulberry? I don't exactly because okay. I, I didn't wondered. even care if I ever smoked it or not. I mean, I don't smoke right. a pipe. I don't smoke, so I just thought it was neat to to carve that something is cool. cool. The coloring it, is really cool. Yeah, and it well the the yeah, the, the markings in it from the mulberry and stuff, yeah. the knots. There was a knot right here. It was basically where the limb came down into the the trunk, and uh, yeah, it made the coolest um, carving. I think <laughs> anyway, I, think I just thought that was cool. To, I think you and your granddaughter are going to have to build frosty, the snowman this winter and put that on him. <laughs> there you go. Stick the pipe in. Yeah. I just <laughs> thought it was fun. I just wanted to try some carving, some things. And that was just something that was sitting here behind me. I thought oh, that was pretty neat. Yeah. Well, I had fun carving that. that. I yeah. have lots of mulberries. So my purpose for making them small was, well, well, just to keep them small too, but mm -hmm. also so I could harvest the berries easier because yeah. I'm vertically challenged. <laughs> And, and our yard, actually both of our places where we're at, um, everything's very, not everything, but we have a lot of hills where we live. So it's pretty rare to find flat land. So at our house, it's flat. And to put a ladder and try to pick berries, you're asking to fall and get hurt. So yeah, only one of, them. only one of my mulberry trees actually produces berries because evidently the other two are male mulberry trees ah. and they do not produce berries. They've never produced berries. I've had the one for it's been there for eight, nine years and it's never wow. produced a berry. So it's a male, obviously. Um, we have three. One produces a ton of berries. The other two haven't started yet and they will see if they may not. <laughs> yeah. I have one, the only one of mine produces berries, but I, again, the one that the, the biggest one, the one that's the oldest, I, I basically, I, didn't care if it produced berries. My goal with that was to feed the rabbits with the mulberry yeah. leaves. It's planted right outside where I keep where my little uh, area is for the rabbitry. And right. I just, I step out, grab a bunch of leaves, step back in. And I actually cut little pieces of the limbs, little pieces, because they love to chew on the sticks and eat the bark yeah. off the sticks. They love yes. that. So I feed them that too. And they love it. I mean, they eat it completely. Um, That's what I've heard that they'll eat that whole thing. Well, we have, I think, we have eight or 10 of them out at our property too, Mulberry. So what so. other books did you mention here? Did you mention I, another book? I don't have access to the document. Oh, uh, Herbal yeah, Recipes because... for Vibrant Health by Gladstar. Is that a, that's a book, I assume? Yes, those are books for, I use a lot, okay. we use a lot of herbs. My herbal collection is pretty large. And then I've started growing a lot. And I have a, oh, I know, I have a link in there for a company called Strictly Medicinal Seeds. They have some really interesting seeds that are kind of hard to find. And okay. I've had wonderful germination from all of their seeds. Okay. Yeah. Strictly and medicinal bought, seeds. Um, yeah. Yeah. I bought ashwagandha seeds, which are kind of. I don't even know what that is. It's an adaptogen. So it um, can help control cortisol levels. And, oh, okay. Yeah. It just kind of helps. Well, I see you have a medicinal uh, herb medicinal herbs by Gladstar also another book yeah, yeah you got two I have books two from of her them. books and then I have um it's like the encyclopedia of herbal if that thing's thick by up uh, is it belt I never know how to say people's names <laughs> I mean either bulk but, uh, it's like bulk bulk yeah he also he's written they've written a couple of books most of them are very thick encyclopedic like this is like a phone book Okay. And then you got another one, Body into Balance. That's another one you have. Yeah. I Groves. Use that. Yeah. Yeah. We use that. So we use a lot of we use a lot of herbal teas and tinctures and stuff here. Yeah. And then you added the uh the the uh videos for the biochar yep. in here. We've put those up before, but they're worth adding again. Yeah. What's this one, uh, uh Jerusalem artichoke as silage? What does that link go to? That goes to a study that was done. Okay. On using Jerusalem artichoke and chutz, silage, okay. which I thought was interesting because Jerusalem artichoke, at least where I live, it's one of those perennials that you plant once and it yes. just keeps going and going. It's kind of yeah. like comfrey. You have to be careful yeah. with it. Yeah, um, the rhizomes will pop out and the seeds but, you drop. Know, you, and... you talked about how your interview. Yeah, is, uh, we actually talk a little bit that. about that. Yeah, we talked a little yeah, bit about that yeah. in that in that podcast. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if they're just using the tops for silage. Um, I read it, but I read it. Well, we'll definitely. I was kind I'll, of half asleep. When I'll I read that a little bit, and we'll get that in the show notes that. also, and make sure that's in the show notes. And then you had yeah. one at the end. Why nutrient dense soil matters for you, your livestock, and your homestead. What What do we got there? Is there a study? 
Yes. I like studies. I do too. I read um, a lot of them. One of the reason I, so for me, at least one of the reasons I started gardening and homesteading was so that my food had lots of nutrition in it. And we know that um, nutrient dense food, if we're, e- if we're feeding our soil, our animals are eating better quality food and we're eating better quality food. So mm-hmm. the reason I put that in there was because um, I think soil testing is important, at least just to start, to give yourself a starting point. Yeah. Um, because sometimes compost, if you're, if you're taking everything out of your garden and you're putting it in your compost and your soil is, div- is void of nutrition, that closed loop system can actually be a problem. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're not getting so. nutrients back to your, yeah. I can yeah. See. Yeah. So that's well, what Nicholas, I, I think- Nicholas Fergus and I once had a conversation about it and I'm not saying it's what you have to do. I'm just saying. It's something that you, I think eventually it would build up and you get it because you're going to get the activity in that compost. You're going to have mycorrhizae. You're going to have the worm castings get up in there. You're going to have things going on. that's going to add to that soil. And eventually I think it would balance out and get better, but yeah, you're right. I think that if you want uh, it to go faster, you want it to go faster. Yeah. I I think you're right. I think um, if you want it to go faster and if, you know, sometimes I, people will say, I've tried several years in a row and I can't seem to get anything to grow everything. Back. Soil test. Like, well, have you done a soil <laughs> yeah, test? Yeah, definitely. No. And, and then they get it back and it's like they have really alkaline or really acidic soil. So yeah. it is a way to jump start if you're in a hurry to get your homestead started and going. It's, it's yeah, a pH test immediately and then even oh, a yeah. full and nutrient. Yeah. If you buy pretty decent ones just on Amazon. And- yeah. Yeah. You can get a soil. I mean, you can check your pH really easy and you can check some, yeah, yeah you can check, do the complete soil test. You know, it's not too expensive or you can, sometimes I think that um, the uh, co-ops will actually, I don't know. Sometimes I think they're free in some counties. I'm not sure as far as doing the might, yeah. soil tests. I'm not real sure, but it, it, it's not very much. I don't think to go through them either way. Yeah. And some of that, it might just determine what you grow for a season and yeah, and just even growing. If you, uh, for example, if you need nitrogen, maybe you grow a lot of beans that year and kind of help instead of stuff that takes it. Yeah. Cause they'll bring it from the, they bring it from the air and put it into the soil yeah. or yeah, you, so. or you plant something with a deep tap root that'll, that'll mine it up like comfrey and pull it from deep down in the soil right. and get it up into the topsoil. I mean, there's just things you can, um, there's things you can yeah. approach it even so on it more natural way. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to like go buy fertilizer exactly. or amendments, but it might help you say, you know what, this year I'm going to grow a lot of peas or this is the cover crop I'm going to choose yep. to help my yeah. soil along. If you know, you need some nitrogen. That. Yeah. Get, get something yeah. that's going to feed it nitrogen or whatever. Absolutely. Well, we'll make sure all this gets into the uh, show notes. I'll add some on tree hay. I found a couple uh, good uh, resources on tree hay uh, that I think is really cool. Cause I think that's just a forgotten trick to feeding your animals that most people could do yeah. that. And yeah, it ties up a lot of space and storage, but if you've got a place you could do that, that's cool. You know, you can definitely harvest that. And this is the wrong time of the year to be doing it, of course. But if you could do that in the middle of a summer, maybe next year, feed your animals that way. I mean, that's a great system to to use to to feed your animals. So uh, I'll put some links in for that. So we got plenty of links. So folks, if you want to see the links uh, or the show notes and any of the links we have for this episode, you can, I'll have uh, the the link to go find those in the show notes. So um uh other than that is there anything else you wanted to add rachel i think that's about it i think we covered quite a bit of stuff there folks get out there and try to close a loop or two on your homestead and become just a little bit more self-reliant self-sufficient sustainable and uh i think it'll do your homestead some good till next week happy homesteading and god bless And, and grow where you're planted Looking around, I finally see I think I need a change The rat race I want to flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free It's a Don't understand
understand why I want to live this way. They never ate them from their land like we do here every day. Snapping beans like Grandma did, sitting on her front porch. Hunting and fishing like a kid, once you've done all of your chores. It's a Today 